Hello, everybody. Um, I'm John Waddell. OK. I'm speaking too loud, huh? How's that? All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm John Waddell, and I'm here with Ryan Brown today. And we're talking about scaling your application on App Engine with Ruby and Doobie. Um, so we're going to talk about App Engine without any feedback, hopefully. So first of all, what is App Engine? It is a cloud computing platform. And that means you can run your web app on Google's infrastructure. And Google spends a lot of time and energy figuring out how to build efficient hardware and data centers and also build applications that are scalable. And so uh, App Engine is a way for Google to provide some of that to you to build your application. And we also provide platform as a service. So unlike some traditional hosting environments where you have a, you know, infrastructure, a box, and networking, and load balancers, and logging, and all that, you basically just give us your code. We run it for you. We bring up as many instances as you need, and uh, hopefully simplify quite, quite a lot. And uh, Ryan's going to talk about architecture. Right. So uh, when you have a request come into App Engine, uh, the first thing that happens, it goes to like closest Google data center, uh, travels through our network to get to the App Engine front end. Um, we've got load balancing here, so you don't have to worry about that. Your application is running on at least three app servers, um, so you've got automatic redundancy there. Uh, we automatically bring up more instances of your application as you're getting more traffic. Um, one another feature of App Engine, you, you just pay for what you're using. Um, you pay CPU as you're using it. Doesn't if you have your app sitting there idle, nobody's accessing it. You don't pay at all. Um, then e each app server gets provides you access to a set of App Engine APIs. We don't allow you to open sockets or anything like that. So uh, we provide you APIs for accessing the outside world. This is an example of one of our uh, like higher profile applications we've had. Uh, the beginning of the year, uh, the president used this for a national on TV White House uh, event. So you can see traffic's going along. Um, this right here was yeah, right at the deadline where you could ask the president a question online, spiked up to like twice the normal traffic. If you're using a normal provider, you would have to provision your servers to handle this 700 TPS the entire time you were, uh, th this ran for three days. So you'd have to have the 700 TPS provisioned the entire time and pay for those servers the whole time. Whereas with App Engine, you just pay for it for those 15 minutes while you were actually running at 700 TPS. So this is, this is what we charge. Uh, it's free to get started. You get a gigabyte of bandwidth, gigabyte of data, six and a half CPU hours uh, for free. Um, and then as you use beyond that, you pay, you set a daily budget if you will never charge you more than that. So uh, if, you, if you run out of quota, your app will turn off. So but we'll never charge you more than you ask for. And you also want to be careful about building an application that's not transferring, you know, you might have another part of your application somewhere else. If you're transferring data in between our data center and your data center, that's, you're going to pay for that, but you might, you know, build an application that has data elsewhere and the client is bringing data into it. So you can avoid that. Well, so let's talk about uh, JRuby on App Engine now, or Ruby on App Engine. So we're using JRuby. As uh, Charles just told us, Ruby uh, uh, on JRuby is fast. It is just Ruby. It uh, is faster than the MRI uh, 1.8 and maybe a little about as fast as 1.9. Some nice uh, garbage collection, those other features. Also, you have a wealth of integration options. And by that, I mean there's all these Java libraries that you can just basically use from uh, JRuby that are very nice. And also, you have all of the supported App Engine APIs for Java. So 
Java is a, an officially supported platform. Their engineers group are working on it. All of those APIs are available to you, and there's not necessarily anything else you need in order to, to take advantage of them. So we like uh, small and modular frameworks. <coughs> frameworks. You can build a nice little rack application. I'll show you how to do that. You can, right now today, very easily build a Sinatra application because uh, you want to load as little code as possible to, do, uh, to respond to each request. And Sinatra does that nicely. If you're feeling kind of experimental, you could try using Merb or Rails. Uh, right now, Rails 3 is not really released, so you have to uh, experiment a little bit with uh, pulling something off GitHub and try it out. And I, I'll show you a demo of that later. And also, you have a Doobie as an option, and we'll show you that a little later. That's something that's not technically Ruby, but it's going to be very familiar to you. We also like Data Mapper for persistence. Uh, unlike Active Record, where you create a model that is, in some cases, empty, and there's some migration that describes your schema in the database, and then the system to synchronize that, your schema is actually in the model, and there are no migrations. If you decide at some point, I want to add a new attribute to the model, you just throw it in there, and now all of a sudden, you have records that are created with this new attribute. Hopefully, your older records that don't have the attribute don't create an issue for you, but you can just put whatever attributes in there you want. Data Store is just going to persist those objects. There's no translation to SQL. There is no SQL. So, uh, and uh, you also have access to extensions uh, like validations, active record finders like find all by first name, etc. You can use those. All the, extensions, whoop, all the extensions should work fine, even though some of the operators that we have are limited because Data Store is a very simple uh, persistence layer. And also, it works with the existing uh, DM adapter for data mapper that uh, Ryan wrote, so you can start using it today. Okay, so it's very easy to install, uh, and these are our tools. You just sudo gem install Google App Engine, and uh, it brings down the whole development environment that we created, and you should do it today. And I'm going to have Ryan talk about uh, some of the things that are there. Right, so, well, <coughs> there's a bunch of gems that get installed when you install Google App Engine. Uh, we have App Engine Rack that's just our tool for integration, integrating with Rack. That's how you configure App, App Engine. Um, the tool, that's the Ruby SDK itself, lets you run your app locally in the same environment as production, so you can test out all the APIs and everything. And App Config is what you use for actually uploading your app. Uh, the App Engine SDK is actually the Java SDK. Um, so we install that for you. You don't have to download um, it separately. Did you mess with the dial when that when you were trying to do it? Did you try? Okay. Maybe just don't and, uh, stand by the that. the App Engine JRuby jars. That's our package I'm version of JRuby. So you okay. run this all in MRI. We automatically start up JRuby for you at the right time, so you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, and then inside your application, uh, we use Bundler, as Yehuda mentioned, if you went to that talk. Um, we use Bundler to package up all of your gems so that you're running the, your app locally with the exact same environment that you will when you deploy it. Um, and so you need to install into your bundled app the App Engine API and App Engine Rack again. And uh, okay, we can talk about the APIs again. So as I said earlier, there's these uh, Java APIs for App Engine. And in some cases, there are restrictions in App Engine, like you're not allowed to talk to sockets or start threads or write files, things like that. So if you want a timer to time your URL and open a socket, well, there's a lot of things you can't do there. But we give you a URL fetch API for that. We also have uh, at the top this user API. You can uh, you know, just integrate with a Google account for authenticating users. You just say it requires a login or it requires an administrator. And administrators are the people who are developers on your app require login is just anyone who has a Google account. So you don't create a database of users. You just use a Google account for that. The data store adapter, of course, is how we communicate with data store. We have a memcache adapter that is uh, a lot like the memcache you're familiar with. It's modified a little bit to work on App Engine, but you shouldn't really need to worry about how it's different. We have a mail API, and I'll talk about XMPP API. Ryan's going to show a demo of that later. Uh, those are incoming and outgoing APIs. The URL fetch API, as I said, is really designed so that you can just say, I want this URL, and it comes down to you, whether it's SSL or get or post, you don't, you don't worry about all the gory details of an HTTP like you would normally 
we just use our API and the URL come down. We also have an images API that is, uh, you know, the low-level Java API, and we had a contributor that created a, uh, a, a wrapper from Ruby to use that, and I'll show you a demo of that later. Uh, the logging API, of course, you need to use because you can't write files, so you use our logger API, and then the logs show up in our logs. Um, and there's a task queue for uh, scheduling tasks. Uh, and I'll have Brian talk about this demo here. Um, so this was just a quick demo I wrote to for an example of uh, using XMPP. Um, so incoming messages, whether it's email or XMPP, get sent as a normal HTTP request to your application um, at a special URL. So you just need to define a handler for that URL and mark your application that you want to receive uh, XMPP. Uh, if somebody, this is so like somebody doesn't DOS attack you by sending you thousands of XMPP messages and you're not even listening to them. If you don't put this here, you won't ever get charged for XMPP messages. Um, and so then we, in your handler, we, we provide uh, stuff for parsing the messages. Um, so this is just a simple echo, takes the message, sends it right back to you. And this is a configure U file that has a rack application inside it with some rack middleware. So, you know, you generally aren't going to build your whole application inside of your rack file, but you can certainly do that. Um, and I think that's a, a great way to get started. Is you want to know how the API works, you build out a little simple rack file like this, try it locally, deploy it to the server, see that it works, and then you can start planning how you're going to actually build it into your application. Okay, so. We're going to do a demo. Uh, we have a little bit of a connectivity issue here, but I'm going to try this anyway. So I've got this uh, very simple uh, hello rack command, and that's, this is what you would see uh, in the rack documentation. Do I? OK, so I'm going to see where I am here. My end. There it is. Okay, so uh, as you saw in that last screenshot, we have a lot of uh, configuration to publish it. So, where was I? I was typing a little application here. Uh, okay, so um, we're going to say the response is okay. We don't need to worry about the headers because App Engine is going to figure out the content links and all that stuff for us. So we're just going to say hello. Hello RubyConf, as a matter of fact. Now, um, so I have this one configure U file. If I run the dev app server and I tell it, please run on this current directory. It's going to see the configure you and say, ah, perfect, that's all I need. It's going to generate a gem file because I didn't have one and generally you're not going to do anything with that one, so it just created an empty gem jar for me. Uh, it also installed our version of JRuby that doesn't have Ruby gems in it because that's going to have a penalty associated with <coughs> it and we don't need it. Uh, we also installed JRuby Rack that allows our, our Rack application to communicate with the uh, infrastructure on App Engine, and it generated <coughs> the configuration files that are actually just XML files that you never need to look at or touch. In fact, if you modify them, we'll just blow away your changes. You just do all your changes and then configure you. By the thing installing, where is that installing? Uh, I will show you that in a second. So if I say new here, hello RubyConf. So that is a very simple rack application, and deploying it to production is just telling it to update. and. I would say that in production, and I can show that in a second. Okay, so can you hold that for me a second? All right, so let's uh, let's take a look at what we have here. Um, I I told it to uh, run. I created a public folder. It probably created robots text and the icon for efficiency. I have a configure U. It created an empty gem file that looks like that. 
If I decide I want to run a Sinatra app, I'm just going to comment out those two things and I'm ready to go. Uh, it also created the web inf directory and that has a couple XML files in it. If you really want to look at the XML files, you can. We uh, allow you to insert additional things into the XML files by putting middleware in the config IU, but for most part, uh, you shouldn't need to worry about that to get started. So let's uh, go back out here to a little more interesting example. I have a guest book. What directory am I on? A little low here. Um, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to look at this other app here that we have. And if you want to uh, run this yourself, you really just want to go to our uh, blog or the code site. And uh, I have the browse source code link here off the, or the blog. There's a demos, there's a Sinatra demo, and the code I'm looking at is this one file here. And it is uh, a little guest book app. So just running it through real quickly, I'm going to use DM core. That's uh, so we have data mapper. I'm using Sinatra. I'm going to connect it to App Engine. I also have one model here which has an ID and a message in it. And that's really all there is to it. There's really no configuration to the database. There's no passwords or ports or hosts. It's just your app has a data store associated with it. You just don't worry about it. If you want to get data in and out of that app, you might build some code to you know, give the data to you. But you really just don't worry about connectivity. Uh, we also are saying here that I want to map uh, uh, hosts and gets to slash and either uh, list all of the shouts or create a new one. So what is, happens when I run that? Well, I'll do that right now. Again, I'm just going to run dev app server. And in a second, it will be ready. Reload it. Hmm. Okay, here it comes. So there it is. <coughs> and that is, uh, I wrote nothing. That is, you know, the simplest app that is putting data into the data store, pulling back out, displaying it. Um, really not that exciting, but. You know, that's really all a web app is in this case is you want to have a persistence layer and you want to make it simple to create and deploy. So uh, the other demo that I'm going to show you guys real quick is my Rails demo. Um, and as I had said, it's a little early to be um, depending on that, but there's certainly something you can look at. There are a lot of conventions and shortcuts in Rails that uh, people want to take advantage of. Uh, and at this point, I guess I can talk about the, some of the concerns that we've had and why we need Rails 3. Rails 2 really had tight integration with Ruby gems. It was using Ruby gems for doing a lot of things and managing your local gems and system gems. And we really don't need any of that. And that is, is a hit that we take on spinning up a new app that we really uh, don't want to have. So we're just using Bundler to figure out what the gems we need before we deploy, and then they deploy up there on your load path and then just run without all this Ruby gem stuff. So Rails 3 will actually function that way. Uh, and if I reload here, I should get this app. And I'll just basically bring up this little screen here to show you what it's doing. Can you guys see that or is that too small? So I have a modified version of that properties info screen. I see that I'm running a new version of uh, <coughs> JRuby here because I've got 187. I told Ruby Gems that it was version 000 because I thought maybe someone would ask for it and I'd put something there, but I don't even have Ruby Gems loaded. It's, it's basically stubbed out. Uh, we also have Rack. I have a bunch of uh, gems that I brought down from GitHub. And then down below that, I have some environment variables that I thought would be interesting from uh, App Engine. Um, I am in development mode. I've got uh, a version of uh, Ruby, JRuby, JRuby Rack the APIs, et cetera. It also says that I'm in, uh, my app is called Rails Primer and it's version three. 
So let's take a look at some of those files uh, real quick. My gem file looks like that. I'm uh, these three things at the top here. You really don't want to mess with those, but I've basically set my sources and I'm pulling from the off GitHub. It's a little bit of uh, uh, an experimental situation to be pulling code right in and expect it to work, but you can certainly do it. We don't hinder that. Um, and if you want to, if you want to, uh, you know, work on pre-release code, your own code especially, you really want to have it in a repository that you can pull it out of because it's fun to to get it from somewhere. Um, the config RU looks like this. Uh, it is, I'm saying that it's version three. I could also make this version 3.0.3 very easily. It doesn't matter, it could be version test. I can make that version a string or an integer. Uh, it will be converted to a string. I also tell it that I want to exclude any of the files that are the Rails files that I don't need instruction. So this Rails excludes is just an array of things like don't give me all the directories that I need for testing and such that I don't actually need instruction because every file you put in production could uh, take time. Uh, I also tell it that I want to set my environment based on App Engine Rack environment. And App Engine uh, Rack is going to figure out whether I'm in production or development mode for me. And that's really uh, the only way you want to do this. Uh, then you can you know, do some things in production with testing and such uh, properly. Uh, also, of course, I in, uh, require this environment and run Rails. And is there anything else interesting in here? And that's basically it. So <coughs> as soon as Rails 3 gems are officially released, I imagine we'll put up a guide showing how to use it. And you should be able to load a request, uh, you know, respond to request with a lot less code than Rails 2 without using Ruby gems. And then you can build parts of your apps in Rails and maybe other parts of your apps you want to optimize a little bit. And uh, we'll have Ryan talk a little bit about ways that you might optimize your app. And we'll do that now. Oh, so let's talk about current issues. I've touched on these a little bit. These are really the main issues right now. The time to spin up a new instance of your application can take for that Sinatra guestbook just under 10 seconds. We're looking at ways to let JRuby work smarter and let App Engine work smarter with it so that we can, we can reduce that. But basically, that is an issue right now. Once your app is running and has traffic, the traffic is going to be responded to in milliseconds. But every so often, as we add a new host, there might be a hit that someone takes. Uh, also, some gem extensions aren't ported to Java yet. Uh, a lot have been. I'm glad to see that Nick Seeger is taking care of uh, hpercot at this point. I imagine that that's going to help uh, if you want to use hpercot. But basically, we need to make sure that gems have extensions that are in Java as well as C, and then they'll work. Uh, and also, this is not an officially supported <coughs> platform by Google, but Google isn't hindering you in any way. Everything you need is part of the Java platform, and it's just a matter of you finding a way to work around some of the issues, like trying to load as little code as possible for efficiency. And there are some issues, of course, with uh, using data store. It's a little bit uh, of something new for most people, but hopefully uh, when you get in there and use it, you'll find it's uh, pretty, pretty cool. All right. Okay, is this one working? Yeah. All right. Okay, so before I started working on App Engine, I worked on making Google Web Search faster. So uh, for me, every couple of milliseconds matters. I really don't like the idea that, you know, one out of n requests, however many it is, takes 10 seconds. So I was talking to Woody one day, and I was like, wouldn't it be awesome if I could write something that looked like Ruby, and it would just spit out this super fast Java code that we could use. And turns out that's basically what Doobie does. So Doobie looks a lot like Ruby, except that it's statically typed using type inference. It has no runtime other than the Java runtime. Um, and it uses Java's type system instead of Ruby's. Actually, you can configure it to use any type system, but since App Engine has Java, that's what I'm going to talk about. So here's a sample Doobie program. Looks a lot like Ruby. The only difference is right here. You have to declare the types of your function arguments. From that, it infers everything else. It's going to infer the return type. 
if you had other variables declared within your method, it figures that out for you. So then when you run the Doobie compiler, it's going to create Java for you. This is what it outputs. Um, you don't have to write this, but. You don't have to look at it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> if it offends you, you can just ignore it. Right. But I mean, the, the thing you can see, there's no, it's not starting up JRuby. It's not doing anything complicated. It's just calling system.out.print line and doing a recursive function call. So here's the more complicated app. This is actually an App Engine app uh, that I wrote as a quick sample. It's meant to look a lot like the Sinatra one you saw before. Uh, we've got this super simple data store adapter here based, I mean, it's kind of based on data mapper. So you do the same type of thing. Um, and then H Java servlets, you get your same similar like REST sort of API just automatically. So one of the things you'll notice, I'm not, I'm not declaring any types anywhere here. Uh, well, except for this. But in the servlet, these are all inferred from the fact that we say we're uh, subclassing HTTP servlet. Um, there's also these things here. These are plugins, which we use for metaprogramming. Um, so I think this is one of the other really awesome things about Doobie is this idea th that you're doing metaprogramming at compile time and also m adding metaprogramming to Java. Like, there's all these great APIs Java has, um, like uh, Google Web Toolkit, uh, all kinds of uh, data structures and things. But I hate writing actual Java code. so. Here's as an example of what a plugin looks like. Doobie, the Doobie compiler is written in Ruby, so I mean you don't actually have to understand most of this. But um, what's going on here? The Doobie compiler, when you when you run it, and it sees this def edb thing, which we've got here. Uh, it reads the file name, it goes, opens that file, and calls erb because it's running in Ruby. And so it just has ERB convert it all to Ruby code and then evaluates that at Doobie at compile time so that when you run it later on, it's just doing string concatenation. Um, so this is what your template looks like. Again, it's using type inference, getting it all from your class so you don't have to declare any types in your template. Um, so. And I guess it's important to add that you don't, if you have something that works really great in Ruby, but it's not especially efficient, it's not an issue because it's a, it's a compile time step that your plugin does, and then the output is just a Java class. So the step of parsing through your Haml or ERB or whatever is just happening without users involved. So here's, here's the same app actually running in production. Um, on Doobie. So same kind of thing. And then another thing Doobie can do is output Java source code. Normally it just outputs class files for you. Um, but I added the ability to generate source code so that you can use Google Web Toolkit. Now, I mean, if you went to the talk on JavaScript yesterday, you might have heard people making fun of it. But he was really making fun of Java, not GWT. GWT is an awesome API. And it does so much more than just JavaScript. It gives you all these tools for making a super fast website, which, like I said, that's what I want. Um, so I've got a quick sample of a really simple Doobie application in GWT. So. Hello, RubyConf. Um, this is all written in Doobie, and it, the Doobie compiles to Java. GWT compiles the Java to JavaScript. And so this is just an HTML file that's all running client-side in the browser. Yeah, and oops. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys have looked at GWT, but GWT compiles you know, 
compresses and obfuscates the code for each browser and every browser that connects gets its copy and if the browser is unknown it has a, some generic one that should hopefully work but it's just not the kind of thing that any person would do by hand. Right, yeah. I, I, when, when I first talked to the GWT people I was like why would I use GWT? I'm sure I can write better JavaScript than this thing can but it is an actual compiler. It's doing optimizations for you. Uh, like he said, it generates a different version for each browser. You can set it up to like generate a different version for each language or things like that. So it, it's really awesome. Yeah. Uh, I look at Ruby and I can see like Groovy. So How much have you looked at Groovy though, really? <laughs> uh, not, not a lot, okay. I mean, it's kind of, so the question is why not why not Groovy if you're going to well, click on this Well, if path. the Groovy guys were trying to make something that uses the Ruby syntax, yeah, it's a little bit different, right? that then, it, I, then I would understand, but it's, it has a different, I think they're trying to make something that's palatable for Java people. And I, I mean, also, I think one of the big things is metaprogramming. I don't know that there's any way to do metaprogramming in Groovy, and I also don't think that Groovy is really statically typed. I think it's got a big runtime that you still have to wait for, and so it still runs much slower than just Java. So at this point, we're just ready for any questions or any other demos. Yes? Can we see the code for the grid app? Yeah. Um, I don't actually have it on this laptop. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah okay. Yes? You mentioned some other libraries from the Ruby side that haven't yet been ported to Java. And you mentioned HPercot. What other ones are key ones that are necessary? Well, so Nokagiri and HPercot are kind of an interesting example. I love to use Mechanize to do all kinds of scraping and building cookie jars and things like that. And Nokagiri uses some native XML libraries that will not function on App Engine. And there's some work done to, to fix that. It's not complete yet. Uh, and uh, HPercot had had some issues working with Mechanize, and so now the current version of Mechanize uses Nokagiri. So there's uh, some work there, but you know it's not insurmountable. It's not that if you really want to make it work and you know a little bit about how to do the Java, then I imagine it could it could be done. We just need to find someone. Um, you towards the beginning you talked about the pricing and everything, and I noticed that you had five thousand. Can you explain, because uh, we well, said our company sends a lot of emails, but to our users, of course. So, what? yeah, I mean, we charge for emails basically to keep people from using it for spam. Right. So that's why there's a much lower limit for actual sending to emails other than yourself. You can send as many emails to yourself as so you want. So 50,000, it could have been like a million. Yeah. Maybe it's just keeping you from some bug that's going to cripple you, having one that Yes. Um, the 10 second startup time. Um, are there cheats that we Well, it's, it's, it's not ish. like there is a 10 second startup time. You can say hello CGI in four seconds or something, but that's not very useful. In, in between now and when, um, when things are sub second, yeah. um, can we cheat and say respond just immediately with, say, do be in one? Well, that's the, right. That's the whole point is that you can, and actually, can you? Hold this. So I'm going to um, show you guys an example, I think, of this. Uh, I have a app that illustrates this. And I haven't, I haven't visited it recently or all day today. But let's bring it up. It's called Fiddlesticks. I hopefully I have connectivity. Did I need to hit return? It's going. Hmm. That seems like that's not right. Well, okay, I think that's kind of hotel data. Okay, so <laughs> Fiddlesticks is, this main page you see is on a caching server, it may, always available instantly. So that's, assume that the first time you saw this page was the first time we actually connected. Um, so these first two iframes I populated are servlets, one, you know, prints some nice HTML, and the other one sends the JSON, and the other one says, hello, rack. And I guess you guys are watching, uh, it took 
about six seconds for Rack to actually respond because I haven't been touching the server. It's been sitting idle. But all I have to do here in my config RU is say some of my URLs go to this servlet or Doobie is actually going to be a compiled down to a servlet. You don't really have to worry about all those details, but you know you can write write pieces of your app in Doobie right. and they compile the servlets. So yeah, and uh, that's another thing like. Another thing I love about Gwit, if you use Gwit, it's going to compile you a static HTML page for your main page, and then you load the rest with XML, HTTP, or RPCs, or whatever. It, you could build your app in Rails 3 and then find, well, there's this one piece that's 90% of my traffic. I can refactor that in, in, with Doobie, and then it's always a second. And maybe Ruby is getting faster and faster trying to catch that one second, but it's, you can do the Doobie today. I'm going to take this question back here. Yeah, we don't have it on this notebook, but it's you know maybe we, it's you come talk to us afterwards. Uh, I had heard that early on that if the, if the app wasn't spooled up, that it would possibly 500. Is is that fixed now? Will it just well if you just if you it, you could take an you could take the existing code for J for Java App Engine and just put. Rails 2.3 on there yourself and put Ruby gems and just put something up there that takes 40 seconds to spin up but is going to get cut off at 30 seconds and see it not work. Right. So that is absolutely plausible. But you, that's, you don't want to do that. Can you talk a little bit more about data store? Because I looked at it a while ago and it looked kind of clunky, kind of hard to do compared to MySQL or MongoDB or whatever. Right, well, so, the, and it's not really comparable to MySQL. Like, basically, the way I like to think about it is just you have it's like an array of hashes. Each entity is a hash. You have a <coughs> string name for all of your properties, and then you can store one of you know various different types in there, and then you can create indexes on those. Um, you can't do things like. Uh, sums and counters and stuff like that. You can't do joins uh, because like, the data is on different physical machines. So it's a lot simpler. There are ways to work around it. There's lots of talks uh, online. If you go to like the Google I.O. site, there's all kinds of videos about how to use the data store efficiently. I, personally, I would much rather use the data store than MySQL. I, I don't like SQL. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons, like, I... And I guess I, I took it with my own browser. So uh, I have some, you know, code that I've been working on where there are certain things that just work great. Like, you don't have all of the operators. You have, you know, equals to, greater than, less than, and you have a subset of operators. All the extensions work. Um, you can do associations, certain associations, by just using the extensions for associations, and they work as you expect. If you're going to do a has many belongs to many, where there's a join table for you, you don't want to do that on App Engine. So what you end up doing is you say, I have a, I have a property called my, like whatever, subscribers, and it's a list type, and you actually can shove right. an array so of entities in there and search for them say, give me all the records back that have Bob, and then you'll get back a list that Bob is in that array. And you can't do that with, with relational database queries, but you can on App Engine. So you can bolt your join table kind of into one side or the other. And right, right now you have to do the association stuff by hand, but you know, it's really, it's not that big of a deal. Right, and uh, so, I mean, if somebody wanted to contribute this, there are ways that you could efficiently implement joins on App Engine, and you know somebody could add that to the data mapper adapter, and it would just be there to use. And, and that is what we need. We need people to come and say, I've built this app, and I need this one feature, and we can certainly help you, or maybe you'll build it, and then the next person will add on to that. Oh, let's take this. Along that same line, um, what kind of times do you have to content distribution networks where you want to push data out to hundreds or thousands of clients using a web app that's hosted on this server? So, I mean, we don't have a specific caching CDN for you. Um, like we said, if you, if you put up static files on App Engine, they are served uh, 
from our front ends before it even, it will never even hit your app. So those will always serve fast. They're served, like your people are routed to the nearest Google data center and then going over our network uh, to wherever it's actually served from. So it is going to be faster than just hosting it at some, you know, one single location somewhere. Or some other competitive content distribution network, there's nothing blocking you from making the calls that you need to make from there to push your data out. Oh, if you want to do that, no. You, yeah. Along those same lines, if you have a more efficient way of doing it or a cheaper way of doing it, I want to hear about it. But I also have to have that feature because without that, my app doesn't work. So I, yeah, I, I don't understand exactly what it is you need. Embedded multimedia display units. Right. I update content over the network. I could be on a daily basis, could be on an hourly basis, I could be streaming tickets. I need to be able to have someone who controls the app, change those directions, change those things, and say, okay, on Monday, push this out to these thousand displays so that the ads that come up in Costco all say this new sale. Um, yeah, I mean, depending on how you do it, yeah, you can definitely do something like that. You can use URL fetch if you need to have the data stored on S3 or something like that. Um, right, it's also, it's pushing static content is very easy. And uh, it's possible that on S3 you might have a lot more work you have to do to build the app out. In our case, you just pushed your app code and we handled everything else. And it looks like we're out of time. So thank you very much, everyone.